Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, well, forum logins at the ready, all you keyboard warriors. We have some of your favourite characters. It's Ian Harford of Team Wilds TV. It's Oliver Power. First, the first television interview with the new chief executive of the Countryside Alliance, Barney White Spunner. To the untrained eye, we're at a gorgeous point-to-point -point in the heart of the Shires. This is Badbury Rings in Dorset. There are foxhounds from the Portman, beagles from the Pimpernel, and all the hilarity of terrier racing, stalls, dogs, children, and country people having fun. But don't be fooled, it is 15 years since the British countryside held the biggest political rally the country had ever seen in London's Hyde Park. It is 10 years since they beat that record with around half a million of us marching against Tony Blair's plans to ban hunting. Blair ignored us. Yeah. Now, England expects the new chief executive of the Countryside Alliance to be the one who gets the hated hunting ban repealed, puts the countryside back into the hands of people who live there and who fights off the threatened death by a thousand cuts that some people in government want to administer to shooting. We are so lucky to have someone of Barney's calibre prepared to step in at what is going to be a very, very crucial few years for the Alliance. What's crucial about it? I think we're coming to the crunch time on hunting. I think the countryside has an enormous need for a champion on a great many things, planning being one to ensure there are homes for rural people, to ensure that businesses can flourish because there's better rural broadband, all the things that actually concern people who live and work here, as opposed to the many, many organisations which champion people who visit the countryside, but that's not quite the same. What we want is to keep the distinct countryside way of life going, and we are the only organisation that actually does that. As an ex-army man, I kick off by asking Barney about his role in the Countryside Alliance. Countryside Alliance is a marvellous mixture of strategists and street fighting tacticians. Which is a great description. Um, well, I like to think that I've sort of come on a journey because, you know, in the military we all start at the bottom and work up. Um, and I think one of the good things about the army is it gives you a bit of experience at all levels, you see what I mean. So um, I've done the street fighting bit. Um, I enjoy the street fighting bit, nothing I like more. Um, equally, I think what people want from me now um, is more to, to, to chart a course um, and to be clear as to what we are going to do. So, the big question, the ban on hunting with hounds and other sporting dogs. Surely this is a priority. Yeah, of course it has, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What, what have you got planned? Well, um, repeal of the Act, and um, that'll happen. Um, the Hunting Act will be repealed, and it's bad law. Um, it, it, it's not supported. Uh, it's a, a law, as we know, brought in um, because the government didn't like the people who did it rather than didn't like what they were doing. Um, how we get there is um, going to require us just to be, to be alert to the opportunities. We, know we got a lot of support from the Prime Minister. You probably heard him on Country File the other day. Yeah, and he said very clearly it's not an issue for, um, it's not an issue for, for, for the criminal law. Yeah, there are people who say to me, well, why bother to appeal it? Well, yeah, you can say that if you're a hunt, hunt follower, but you, you know, hunt staff, you, we just can't leave hunt, hunt staff in that, in that position, you know, trying to hunt within this badly framed, pernicious, you know, illiberal law. But we will get that, and we will do it, and I'm absolutely confident of that. But people have got to stick with us and not think, oh, well, you know, it hasn't, wasn't appealed in the last election, oh, you know, I'm in a grump, and that's what we hope for. You, that's naive. You've got to you know, stick with the campaign. Among the party faithful is ace fly fisher Charles Jardine, who, thanks to the support of the Countryside Alliance Foundation, is educating children all over the UK with fishing for schools. Absolutely thrilled with Barnes' appointment. He's a man that understands fishing, for one thing. He, he, he does fish, he's got a bit of, I think, the axe. So he knows firsthand the problems and the areas that, that concern anglers. And that, that's a breath of fresh air for me. That's not to say we didn't have an angling interest before, we always have. But to have somebody that actually knows, I suppose, the, the issues and grasp of those issues, that's so important, I think, for the overall alliance balance. I really do. I think, it's a, it's a, I, I think we're, we're in a new, new age. We really are. I'm thrilled. Fishing for schools is a cause that's really resonating with Barney. One of the critical issues um, is really to further the foundation. 
Um, and the Foundation really is a wonderful thing. It really does two um, extraordinarily valuable programmes. Education, getting children out in the countryside, and this fishing for schools, which Charles has just been chatting about. We have got to get better at our education, on that, and that's why the Foundation is so, is, is, is so critical. Barney is here to talk to people, both face-to-face -face and in groups. Everyone wants to hear him. He has only been in the job for a few days, but he has had to hit the political landscape running. Uh, even in the short week I've been there, we have a bill introduced to introduce a close, closed season for hares in this country. Um, and we also, as you probably know, there's only a closed season for selling hares at the moment. Um, we also have a quite well supported private members bill trying to ban children from using shotguns. You know, two things just since Christmas, which maybe don't hit the headlines, but the sort of things that the Alliance on a daily basis um, is fighting on your behalf. He's worried about stopping children from using shotguns. I wonder whether the antis should be worried about Barney being a much bigger weapon. Your role as a guided missile. Um, <laughs> guided missile. <laughs> where did that come from? <laughs> where, where, where are you going to land? <laughs> oh, the whole point about guided missiles is they can be guided in flight, isn't it? <laughs> if I was a dumb missile, I would choose where I was going to land and fire myself. The whole point about being a guided missile is I can, be con I can control my flight and I will control my flight depending on where we're going to have most effect. <laughs> For more about Barney and the Countryside Alliance, visit www.countryside-alliance.org.uk. Well, repeal of the Hunting Act, that would be news. In the meantime, let's make do with David on the Field Sports Channel, News Stump. This is Field Sports Britain News. The National Trust is starting banning game shoots at its properties. They include Polesden Lacey in Surrey and Wallington in Northumberland. So what can shooters do? Professor Caroline Tisdall is both a council member of the National Trust and a trustee of the Countryside Alliance Foundation. Every bequest to the Trust for a major estate at some point entailed the planting and hedgerows and the whole tradition of shooting, major part of countryside tradition. And to, to betray that would be to betray donors' wishes and the aspirations of all sorts of people who live and work in the countryside, not just visit. Popular West Country shooter, novelist and clay coach Rod Brammer has died following a battle with cancer. A former naval commander, Rod was well known for his trenchant views on wildlife management, which often landed him in the newspapers calling for magpie and grey squirrel culls. His son Matt takes over the Sheldon Shooting School in Devon. Visit www.sheldonshootingschool.co.uk. It's one of the trickiest stands in clay shooting. At the shooting show last weekend, Pat Dickman, here pictured on the right with Browning's David Stapley, scored 19 out of 20 to win a Browning 525 in the Browning Rabbit Mania. And finally, no one really cares for antis, but it takes an American to really get to them. We're in North Carolina, where a group of antis called Showing Animals Respect and Kindness, or Shark, launched this radio-controlled helicopter to try and film pigeon shooters. The American pigeon shooters respond the only way they know how. And down it comes. You're now up to date with Field Sports Britain News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. David there, more Clark from Kent than Clark Kent. Now to a real Superman, it's Ian Harford of Team Wilds TV. This farm in Fife is plagued by pigeons. I've already had success during the day, but to really get on top of them, we plan a nighttime assault. So the reason I'm wearing a mask tonight, that even though there is no, there's no light here, there is a full moon, but even then it's faint. We're going into the sheds and it's going to be completely black. Is that when I switch the illuminator on to this uh, to this night site, when the digo and it shines on my face. It did provide some reflection. I do have shockingly white skin. So covering up my hands, covering up my face, anything that's gonna be around this screen will just help break up that uh, light so they can't, they won't even know we're there. So that's the plan. So this is the size of the problem. There are literally hundreds of pigeons in here. 
mess on the floor is pretty bad. You can just see from the sheer numbers, they have no concern of the fact we're here. No idea we're here. This night site really is an incredible piece of equipment. Look at those. Just zoom out a second here, give you a full picture. Look at that. The barn is full of cattle and we only have the wide centre aisle from which to shoot. reload and I'm bringing a spare magazine. So we've had to reload, we've had to put some more air in the gun. This is intense, it's probably the most insane pigeon control exercise I've ever done in my life. There are simply hundreds and hundreds of pigeons in there and they have absolutely no idea we're here. I've actually taken my face mask off now because even with the light I'm on full um, illumination they're not even bothered, they're not even looking at us. So. We've probably got about 50-55 on the deck at the moment. Um, I'm taking body shots mainly, as you'll see from, from the footage a little bit later. Headshots and neck shots on pigeons in a barn like this, they're not, not advisable really. There's plenty of penetration in this 177 sub 12 foot pound air rifle. If you stick it up near the head and you miss, you're going through an asbestos reef and you're causing damage. And that's not what we're here for. We're here, here to keep these winged menace under control and we're doing a pretty good job so far. So loading up, spare magazine, more air, and we're going back for more. The Huntsman and Night Sight combo is incredibly efficient and the birds keep falling. The only problem is having just 10 shots in the magazine. After the latest recharge, I take a position outside the barn. It's another great vantage point, although the cows are getting a little too close for comfort. So, one of these cows is new age hippie type cow because it was just licking the end of my barrel and nearly got itself a piercing so I think what we're going to do now because there's far too much interest at this end of the barn I'm just going to get down and we're going to do another little tour of the inside reload find a new position in the middle of the floor probably seated this time and then we're just going to work our way around the rafters again amazingly I'm now nearing my century Ninety-six. Ninety-seven. Ninety-eight. Ninety-nine. And one hundred. One hundred feral pigeons. It's my personal record. And I got one in the mag, so... One at one for luck. Andy Richardson is a guide with a nose for pigeons, and he certainly delivered the goods tonight. So how did the relationship start with you and the farmer? How did you find this barn? God, myself and this particular farmer used to drink together when we were in our teens. So it's been a kind of 30 year friendship. You know, we've been the young farmers together. Yeah. So, so what you're suggesting is, if you go down the pub more often and bump into cool people, you get decent shooting. That's right, yeah. You must tell my wife that. I know. As the night's gone on, we've got bolder and bolder, throwing more and more light around the shed. Now we're going full on. We're gonna use a foxing lamp to see just how big a problem these pigeons are. And for my grand finale, I see how many birds I can knock down with my last full magazine. So it's my last 10 shots, my last mag, and Andy's challenged me to see if I can get 10 out of 10, so. Watch and learn. One. Three. Five. 
Seven. Nine. Ten. Andy says a lot of the fallen birds will be trodden into the cow's bedding, so I start clearing up. Looks like these fellas are getting trodden in already, so I've got a bit of work cleaning up. I've spent about two hours having a whaler time. Now comes the dirty work. Go on then, get on, get on. It was all going so well. When one animal feels I'm invading his personal space. Get on. He looks a little shifty, so I keep an eye on him. However, he's too fast for me. The dairy cross ball puts me on the deck and I exit the barn as fast as I can. Yep. Behind the camera, David offers some reassuring words. Whilst Andy suppresses a laugh. Sure. Uh, I lost I lost an argument with the cow. Oh, no, he ran me. Against the wall, yeah. It's okay. You sure Ian? I don't think I'll break anything. You sure? Oh. Sit down for a second. I'm winded, and we later discover I'm nursing two crack ribs, but the show must go on. Uh. <sighs> right. Do you think I'll be? Explain what happened then. Well, I was uh, just in there trying to gather the pigeons up. These cows look a little bigger than the other ones, and uh, I think uh, there's a few that have been half eaten around there, so I think they've been chewing on them but I lost an argument with a very big beef cow. One like that. In fact, that might be him right there. I'll tell you what, you'll get it. Don't... Oh, yeah. Yeah. So what a phenomenal night. That has to be one of the greatest night shooting of my entire career. 110 birds on the floor, 10 out of 10 on my last magazine, and that wasn't the only excitement. I even got rammed against the wall by one of those huge pedigree balls in there as I was cleaning up the birds. So a night I'll never forget, but I'll be sore in the morning. Farrells <laughs> <laughs> and Harford being hit hard. Ian taking note. Ooh, there. Spare rib, anybody? No, mushrooms. And I don't mean any of that hippie stuff. I mean, what happens to a bullet inside a deer? Oliver Parr of the English Safari Company is field testing the 65 by 55 on muntjac and Chinese water deer. It's a beautiful, crisp winter's morning, and we're not the only ones out stalking. There has been a heavy frost in the Cotswolds, which will make our life a lot harder as we work our way through the woods. As the sun rises, the English safari company's Oliver Power takes up a position with a long view down a ride. Today he wants to illustrate the performance of his favourite 65 by 55 Norma ammunition. It's not got the history or the fan club in the UK that the 243 and 308 have, but the tide is turning. I've noticed a lot of UK stalkers now changing over to using 6.5 by 55, the Swedish Mauser. It's a fantastic all-round rifle shooting right down from Monk Jack right up to Red Stags. It has fantastic accuracy and on this particular rifle I shoot uh, two weights of bullet, one being the BST Nosla 120 grain and the 156 Oryx. Usually if we're trophy hunting I'll use the 156 Oryx and if I'm cull hunting, I use the uh, Nosler BST 120s. So I was asked to go down the range to test fire this and see what type of groupings we picked up. Uh, all done at 100 metres, uh, all five shot placements on it. And it's been a very consistent, very reliable, very durable, and essentially with the rifle and scope, it's a very lightweight piece of kit to carry around. Nothing seems to be interested in moving. The muntjac we know are here will be sitting tight, so maybe our crunching might stir things up a bit. The plan works, and a doe dives out of the cover. Oliver takes the only shot on offer, and she's on the ground. As always, the muntjac are buried deep in the brambles, and uh, this doe 
shot out straight in front of us. Um, bit of a snapshot. Um, what we used was my uh, 65 by 55 uh, chambered with uh, the 156 grain uh, Oryx round and um, she was uh, tail pointing towards us, uh, slightly turned on turning her face over her back and um, you know sometimes when you're out stalking you know you can't always get the perfect shot placement but um, this is a, a glancing head blow to this animal with this heavy oryx but it still did the job at the end of the day it put it down straight away killed it outright so if you'll see from the uh, wound channel uh, we've got this glancing which has lacerated everything and what I would perceive from the shot is that because it's such a heavy, dense round, animals will die from shock. A lot of people are not aware of this. Because of something hitting you, you can also die of the shock. It doesn't have to be puncturing all the vital organs to kill it. Shock can kill something outright as well. And this is what has happened with this animal. The power of the round is clear and Oliver believes it should be appealing to trophy hunters. It's designed to kill cleanly without leaving a great hole that a taxidermist would struggle to fix. To help show this, Oliver has been invited by Zeiss professional stalker Paul Childerley to help with his Chinese water deer cull in Bedfordshire. There are no trophies on offer, but Oliver is going to take out a young animal with a heart shot using the same 156 grain Norma soft point. We get into a group that are sitting tight in a dip out of the cold wind. These animals seem happy to remain seated, thanks very much. When they finally do get a sense of impending danger, they're off. We move across to another part of Paul's ground and, this time, a group that have been spooked head towards us. They stop and a heart shot is now possible. The animal doesn't drop immediately. Adrenaline pumping, she moves, but she is very dead. Right, so we have the uh, 156 grain Normal Oryx round, which is a core bonded bullet. Uh, it's entered just behind the shoulder here. This is the entry wound. And if we gently turn this old girl over. She's slightly quartering away from the rifle. And here we've got the uh, exit wound here. Oliver carries out a dissection and shows the damage done by this bullet. So here we have the uh, heart, which has been totally minced by the Oryx round, truly opened it up. And now here we move across and we see some of the trauma that has occurred on, on the lungs, clipping the lungs as well. It is even clearer in the larder where ribs, muscle and organs have not forced the bullet off course. This is a, a bullet hitting bone. It's not deviated from its path. It's gone straight through into the vital organs, into the heart, punctured through these next two ribs without deviating anywhere because we can't see any bullet fragmentation going anywhere else but through here. And as it's punctured through, we can still see the ballooning effect of the hydrostatic shock, which is about 12 centimetres across in diameter. Bullet weight retention in this instance is vitally important. Oliver shows just how good it can be. A client came a couple of weeks ago uh, and shot a monk jack. The entry wound was here and the oryx travelled straight down here in a very acute angle, mushroomed, taking out all the vital organs and lodging itself in the haunch. And uh, we found on the bulge of the skin the mushroom round. Norma are very uh, proud about the bullet retention that this oryx keeps. And this essentially has only lost about 9% uh, of its body weight when passing through the monk jack. We also shot a, another oryx round into water just to show you uh, what we would consider a nice mushroomed round. And again, this has lost about, being fired into the water, lost about 10% of its weight. It's all about staying together. For the 65 by 55 120 grain plastic tip, it's all about falling apart. This X-ray of a fox shows just how the smaller plastic tip calibers fragment on impact. And here is the 6.5, which Oliver has retrieved from his own experiment. We fired one of these into water and retrieved all the fragmentation just to show essentially 
how many shards actually uh, come away and how it literally is like a grenade when it goes off. To field test Norma's 65 by 55 plastic tipped bullet, we're after another muntjac. We spot a nice metal buck and he continues on his way. However, just a bit further along, we spot a doe. Oliver shoots it in the neck. Very pleased with it. Next shot, 6.5 by 55, 120 grain uh, BST at about 100 metres and uh, down she went. The 6.5 by 55 is a versatile calibre and with the bullet options on offer, it will perform well whatever deer species you're stalking. Well, we're back next week when we have three deer, one cartridge, the 308. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please don't hesitate to hit the subscribe button that's about there on the screen or go to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv, scroll down to the bottom where you will find the constant contact form into which you can pop your email address to allow us to spam you or click to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, same thing. We'll tell you about our programme which comes out from 7pm UK time, Wednesday, every week. This has been... Field Sports Britain, more bangs than anything else on telly.